Are nursing students present? We didn't get them. All right. So I do want you to know that we normally do these events on Fridays. And so we're going back to Fridays after today. We had a, a room scheduling issue. And so that's why we're doing this on Tuesday, September 1st. So remember, Fridays will be our day from now on. We do have our October speaker that you're looking at on one of the slides, and um, she's coming from Mizzou, University of Missouri, and she's going to be talking about the effects of SNAP on health outcomes for low-income households. So if you're interested in food access, nutrition, the relationship between the food access and chronic diseases, she should be a really interesting speaker for you. Everybody should have an evaluation form in front of you. Those evaluation forms are really important for us as a public health training center for two reasons. Number one, we really value your feedback. We look at what you say. And then we also collect the demographics on who attends our sessions. And so if you will please complete that form and leave it in the back of the room or at the end of the table or hand it to Crystal or Laura, who is outside giving you your lunch, that would be very much appreciated. I also want to welcome our, on our, our web visitors. We're doing GoToMeeting today or GoToWebinar. So we are streaming this live, and someone somewhere is watching us today. I just have a feeling that they are. We will confirm that later on. But I want to welcome those people and let you all know that we are streaming it live today. And um, I think that's about it. I want to ask somebody who's sitting in the back, like, why you guys are all sitting in the back like that, lined up like that. So next time, if you'll come down closer to the front, that would be really great. Um, if I had some prizes, I would give you prizes if you came down to the front. I'll work that out, incentives for sitting in the front. But you guys look like a firing squad sitting back there in that last row. All right, um, I think that everybody had an opportunity to look at the bio for our speaker today, and honestly, I don't have the bio up here. But I've spent a lot of time with Maris in the last 24 hours, and I am very pleased to have her as our guest today. And she's with Change Lab Solutions, and that is an organization that has a lot of relevance for the kind of work that we're doing in communities here in West Virginia. Her organization specializes in the assessment of different public policies, laws, and regulations, and their connection to building quality communities around the United States. They have a lot of experience in working in different states, working in urban and rural communities, and she has a staff that's comprised of people who are in public health and both in the legal field. So I think making this connection between public policy communities and the quality of life in those communities is what we're going to learn about today. And I think it's really important and interesting. And so I'm going to turn it over to Maris. Please say thank you and enjoy. So I might need to do a little, um, I'm not as tall as, as Lori. Um, how's that? Is that good um, sound? Great. Well, I'm really thrilled to be here. This is my um, first visit to West Virginia, but um, I've, I travel all over the country into um, large cities, small cities. Um, Change Lab Solutions has worked in all 50 states. We're based in Oakland, California, um, but we work with communities um, all over the country. And I'm going to focus today on law and policy, and I'll talk a little bit more about Change Lab Solutions, but really draw experiences from um, rural communities. I'm going to have one slide about California, because I, I was in Pittsburgh yesterday, and they said, you know, it's kind of like the left coast, and we don't like California people around here. You, you come in and talk about law and policy, and you're from California. We think you're all, um, you know, different than us. I'm, the work that I'm going to talk about today is being done all over the country 
including some really nice projects here in West Virginia that I'll focus on and ask you about if you have any ties to them, um, and really focus on particularly the needs of rural communities and how law and policy blends with rural communities. A little bit more background for me so you know a little bit where I'm coming from. Um, I did my master's in public health many years ago at UC Berkeley. Um, my training was in health education and I worked for local government. I worked for a local county health department and you will see local county health departments and local agencies replete in what I'm about to talk about because that's where change happens. Most change happens at the local level. And we'll give example after example and it's the state local partnership that's going to be key to what we talk about here today. I started working in tobacco control. We had the first countywide, 18 cities in our county, smoke-free workplace ordinance in the country. That was my job, was doing the dog and pony show city to city, getting smoke-free workplaces. And from that, I started working on environmental justice issues. We had a large petrochemical um, industry in the county I worked in, and low-income communities, located right up against the plant gates and that got me interested into land, in land use issues. And so I started really realizing that health education, I didn't have enough training and I went back to law school and I did my law degree at Berkeley about 10 years later. And since then, what Change Lab Solutions is, is really a blend of health education and law. I kept asking questions like, are we allowed to do this? How does this work? Basic questions on the function of government that as a public health person, I needed to have answers to. It was scary for me to work in, in policy issues because I didn't know what a statute was compared to a regulation, compared to legislation, all these basic things that we need to be effective public health people, persons, I, I needed answers to. And that's what Change Lab Solutions provides the field. We're dedicated to healthier communities for all through better health, through laws and policies, and I'm going to give example after example of why law is essential to public health. This may be, I hope it's familiar to you, this is Tom Frieden's Pyramid of the Social Determinants of Health and Impacts, but you'll see, and I understand that people who are watching online can't see the little um, 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 pointer from the, from the um, this, this thing here, but um, what we see is increasing individual effort is needed for health improvement, goes up to the top of the pyramid, and this is health education, what I'm trained in, what my master's in public health is, and I call it um, the finger wagging school of health education. You know, you really should um, quit smoking. You really should um, exercise more and lose weight and eat healthfully. That's, that's the finger wagging. And we know that it takes a lot of effort, and in fact, it doesn't work too well. That's why it's the decreasing point of the pyramid. What works best is working on the socioeconomic factors. This is issues like the educational system, housing, poverty alleviation. These social conditions, what we call the social conditions, the social determinants of health, is where we're going to have the biggest increasing population health impact if we're working at this level. And we're going to talk about socioeconomic factors and changing the context changing the context to make the individual default decision healthier. Classic example is tobacco control. When we got smoke-free workplaces and we raised taxes, that's what drove tobacco use rates down. It wasn't the finger wagging, even though we all knew it. I used to smoke a pack a day. I know all about it. And when tobacco tax went up, this will age me, to 75 cents, when the price of a pack of tobacco went up to 75 cents, I said, I can't afford this anymore, and I quit smoking. Um, so I'm, I'm um, a little poster child for how well this works. And when smoke-free workplaces came in, even more people quit and higher taxes. But we also know that this is from the county health rankings work. Um, that health behaviors, we always want to improve health behaviors, that's the goal. We want people to quit smoking, to exercise more, and, and to eat healthier foods. The health behaviors in the environment contribute to 70% of health outcomes, but only 4% of our public health budget is dedicated to that. All the rest goes to medical care delivery, which really, we're doing more and more genomics these days, but the access to care and genomics really are a much smaller fraction of what's going to influence particularly population health outcomes. Of course, we have the individual success stories, but on a population-based level, it's going to be working on the environmental conditions that drive health behaviors. 
I want to talk about, that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the day, the environment and our health. And I'm going to start looking at a whole bunch of slides on health and all policies. Before I do so, you're going to see that these are all very local policies. If, if we think that the prevention dollars, the 4% of our federal budget going to, or national budget going to health, is going to create the outcomes we need or we think health departments can use this 4% to really drive the behavior and environmental changes, we're wrong. We'll fail. Public health will fail if it tries to do this alone. There is no way 4% can affect 70% of health outcomes. So what we need to do is really look in what we call a health and all policies context. Where we live, where we work, where we play are the conditions, that lower part of the of the um, pyramid that affect our health outcomes, affect our behavior choices, and affect um, the environment. So health is in all parts of a community. It's the food that we have access to or lack of access to. The air and water we breathe. We were at an event last night talking about straight piping and, and a huge potential determinant on health, access to clean water, sewage disposal. This is basic public health from the turn of the last century, right, where we thought we were on top of these basic conditions, and even in many rural and low-income communities, not the case today. Whether we have safe places to play. Is there transportation to get us where we need to go? Active transportation, um, biking, walking to schools, access to a school bus or mass transit so that we don't have to be using a car and affecting the air quality. Do we have access to tobacco-free environments? What's the condition of the housing? Lead poisoning, mold, mildew, asthma triggers? These are social determinants of health. You can do all you want getting that kid to use the inhaler. But if he or she is exposed to mold and mildew and roaches and, and, and rats in, in their home, they're going to keep getting those asthma triggers. And guess what? They lose school. When they, can't, when they have an asthma attack and they lose school and they're not reading by third grade and their parents can't go to work because they've got to stay home with it. this whole cycle, all linked to the social determinants of health. What kind of community we, we offer in, as far as recreational opportunities, job opportunities, what are the quality of our schools? These are all the issues at the bottom part of, of Frieden's pyramid, and these all require public policy to affect. For health departments, don't have, can't do it alone because they don't have the know-how. What do we know about housing? Not so much. We might do lead poisoning um, prevention work, but we really don't know how to get access to affordable housing and what to do too much about the mold and mildew. We don't have the, the dollars to do it. We don't have the legal authority to do it. So we have to work in partnership with all these other aspects of civic life. In some communities, in some states, the state has all the power to do that, and they delegate it out to local levels. In other states, local government has all the power, and a little bit is left to the state. The state of California is that way. West Virginia is very mixed. West Virginia has authority to do some things, but not others. And in some instances, it depends on the size of your city, if you'll have authority over land use decisions or not. Otherwise, it's to the state. So this partnership through different levels of government is absolutely critical for you to understand in place here in West Virginia, where do you have the authority to take action and where do you need partnership, either going up to the state or out to other civic players. Um, being here in a university, you have access to the School of Agriculture, the School of Physical education, I've met people, the whole school of physical education, it's amazing. I don't think that's true in many universities. Um, all of the social determinants of health are under the umbrella of West Virginia University. So this partnership from the school out can be modeled throughout um, the state. How much connectivity we have. These are all policy level decisions and I want to talk about what makes for a strong policy. It doesn't come um, naturally to folks, and there's certain hallmarks. I want to talk about what are policy systems and environmental change strategies, and then really what makes for a strong policy. So let's give some examples here. Policy change. 
creating or changing a written statement of an organizational position, decision, course of action, it's made public, can be done with the nonprofits, and it can be done with the business sectors. A systems change is really unwritten. Ongoing organizational decisions, basically how we're doing business, how we're conducting. I'm going to give some examples of these. And then environmental change is the built environment, the physical, economic, social, normative, bottom end of the pyramid, how we are um, conducting our work so that we can see it. It's observable. Let's start at the top, policy change, rewriting your vending machine policy. I don't know if you have a vending machine policy in the School of Medicine and this Health Sciences. Let me suggest that you do, that you, mo you walk the talk and you have healthy vending in all of, your, um, all of your sales. So you can rewrite your vending machine contract to with the, the vendor to make sure that you only get healthy foods. You can have a systems change, you ask your distributor only to stock the healthy foods, and you can have the environmental change where you get rid of the sodas. You just say we're not having sodas here anymore because we know it's their uh, precursor to obesity and, and dental health problems um, carries. A policy is a, a local ordinance, it's something that's written, a zoning code, School policies, wellness policies in um, all schools that have um, free and reduced lunches have wellness policies. Contracts, agreements, that means you can enforce your policy with contracts and agreements. The university, I'm sure, has all sorts of policies on you know, how you get up in the morning, probably. If you work here, you'll probably feel like you've got a lot of policies. But what kind of classes you can take and what the prerequisites are, these are all written down. You can look them up, you can verify them, and there should be some accountability to them. And we'll talk about how this gets played out in the real world. Statement and writing, binding with accountability, and sets out a general approach that everyone can understand. It allows for accountability and, and for enforcement. And last night, I, um, in our, we had a meeting with the law school and the School of Public Health. I was, and some of the local county commissioners came from Macaw County. Um, the, one of the things that really struck me in that conversation about this state, and I don't hear it everywhere, but I came through so loud and clear, is we're a self-reliant, can-do state. We roll up our sleeves, literally and figuratively, put our shoulders to the wheel and get a job done. And we don't look for a lot of outside input. We like to do it ourselves, a lot of self-reliance. And the state is reinventing itself with, with coal changing so much, and particularly in Macau County. What they were really looking for is some accountability, that we're accountable for ourselves. And so often, law is, um, is thought of as big government coming in and telling us what to do. And it really does not have to have that um, patina whatsoever. What it can be is how we're going to hold ourselves accountable for the goals and the vision that we want to have. And that's if I were working in West Virginia, that would be the approach that I would take with communities throughout this state is where do we want to go and how are we going to hold ourselves accountable so that when we roll up our sleeves, we know if we get there or not. And it also reaches more people. The problem with the health education, the finger-wagging health education alone, is your, it's one-to-one, -one, small group to small group. There is absolutely a place for this. I'm sure when your next speaker comes and talks about SNAP benefits, there's going to be a whole lot about nutrition education, and it's absolutely essential. We have third, fourth generation of fast food. That's what people know how to cook, and back to the basics, we don't know how to do that anymore. But if you just do the nutrition education without having strong policy to make sure that mom, that dad has access to healthy foods, the nutrition education won't have a way of expressing itself because of the lack of access, and that's going to take a policy approach. It's not always the right tool, and it's not just a big city event. Particularly, I want to give a little hats off to the Centers for Disease Control. They're funding here in West Virginia, the Community Transformation Grants, which keeps getting cut off and pitch is getting cut off, maybe now. Um, but it, there's such tremendous work going on in rural communities all over this country. I can call out California, too. Um, our very rural communities are leaning into this work in a, in a big way and because the disease rates are so high and they realize that an individual behavior change approach alone won't, won't cut it anymore. So these are the nine 
policy strategies I'm going to go through. I'm going to give examples of each, um, but it's a, it's a policy system, environmental change. It's data-driven. It's ambitious yet feasible. It addresses health disparities. We will get nowhere unless we address the health disparities. Financially feasible. You got to work within your budget. And it's legally feasible. We're going to talk about, you know, if the federal government controls it, you can't do it. If the state government controls it, you can't do it. It's got to be legally feasible at the local level. Implement and enforcement are clear. It changes the conversation. We'll get into that. And it's just one piece of a larger puzzle. This is particularly, I will say, in obesity prevention. Um, as if I were to compare obesity with um, tobacco control, obesity prevention with tobacco control, we've got such good cause and effect in tobacco control. We know exactly what causes lung cancer, and you know when you, when you what to do to reduce smoking rates, which will reduce lung cancer and, and emphysema. It's not so easy in obesity. That causative, it's much more complex. That causative factor isn't there. We have to eat. We don't have to smoke. Um, our food is our culture. It's often our religion. Um, it's what mom provided us. It's our safety valves. Um, it's much more complicated to work on food. So we, we have to do lots of things. Um, it, and it's every, no one thing is going to be the magic um, trigger the way we're, a couple of really important things have been proven to be true in tobacco. So ele element number one, it's a policy system and environmental change. And I want to talk to um, about a, a group in um, North Carolina, a town called Greenways. Small community, population 58,000, that's big compared to some of the communities here in West Virginia. But nonetheless, certainly not an urban area and lots of cities within this county, small cities. So lots of small communities. And they had a history of biking and walking. Kids would bike and walk to school. That used to be the norm. Everybody did that. Now, I, I bet you've been in rooms. How many people still, you know, were able, we, we do it demographically. How many of us, you know, 50 and older biked and walked to school and how many 20 and older, you know, to 20 to 40? Not so many. Um, so there was increasing obesity rates in this community and they realized that there wasn't physical activity built into everyday life. There weren't, it wasn't safe anymore to send kids to bike and walk. And so they started a walking program, they started a biking program, but they could reach so few people at once. And the county administrator said, listen, we want to do this systematically. We don't want to do it one off, one off, one off. We're all in this together. Communities were traveling back and forth for schools because they shared resources. They had to solve this problem together. So they passed a policy that was countywide. Let me read you some of the elements of that policy. All railroad easements shall be incorporated into a comprehensive transportation plan. All new construction in the county should look for ways to be connected to the to the, the designated greenways. If they couldn't be, if they couldn't put new development in connectivity, they had to put funds into a pot to create open space around that development so there would be some place to recreate and to play. People with disabilities had to be taken into account. So an encouragement for black topping so people in wheelchairs and walkers and canes would have a smooth space to, um, to travel. So all of this ensures that future road work considers open space, walkability, bikeability, and provides guidelines for having to get that done. It's not going to be just happenstance and good luck. It's going to be a vision and that vision written down that guides the new development. Oops. Here's another community in, in Mississippi. <clears throat> this community, it's called Mountain View. They got community transformation dollars. Eight county health departments got together. Very rural community, again. And I bet a model in many ways for the tiny little towns and, and small health agencies in this state. They are a very self-reliant place, too, and didn't want big government coming in, telling them what to do or how to get things done. But what they had lost along the way, very high disease rates, um, is, is connection to the land, connectivity to the land, a long history of farming, canning, putting things into preserves, healthy foods, stocking up that they had lost connection with. The grandmas kind of knew what was going on, but the younger generation 
really didn't practice that anymore. And they used that cultural history as their grounding for what they wanted to do and, and to create healthy foods for their communities. With that impetus, they um, started reaching out to local markets um, and to the food distributors, the, the, the big companies that brought food into their communities um, to say, listen, we have to have healthy foods. And they engaged the food distributors in who brought it into the small um, county marketplaces where people shopped um, to make sure that they had signage for healthy foods, they price the price points um, were affordable for healthy foods, and they changed their land use to encourage um, community gardens. And their nutrition education was being, how do we can healthfully? How can we do our preserves and take our, our fruits and vegetables and make them last all year long? Affordable. Um, and, and working at many levels, not just in one little town, but collectively and with the distributors. A lot of the ideas that they were given by CDC when they started their community transformation grants were um, big city ideas. And um, they really pushed back and owned these ideas for, for themselves. We don't do a lot of canning and preserving of, of fruits and vegetables in, in the big cities. There isn't that much access to fruits and vegetables. Com urban agriculture is growing, but it won't be sufficient for the, the depth of population. Um, but in rural communities, it's different. And so it was knowing their cultural roots, building on that, and then working together and with systems outside of their communities to make the changes they needed. This is West Virginia, another community transformation grant. Uh, anybody here work with, with the West Virginia project? Yeah. Okay, a couple of folks. You tell us. I know you. I can't hear you on the mic, but I'll, let me say what I know and then you add to it. So my understanding is that there's a big pipeline development getting people into the health sciences through this. I hope that's true. And a focus on um, um, healthy futures in, in West Virginia. And this was another food access in, in very rural communities. And they worked with Walmart. They worked with the distributors. They worked with churches all of the assets they had in their communities and, and set some standards for the kind of food that they wanted to have brought and just even with the, the food pantries at the churches, having a food policy for the quality of food that would be distributed, that it's not okay just to take the unhealthy handoffs from um, Safeway or whatever grocery stores you have here, but in fact we want quality food to be going to the communities. Anybody who worked in on CTG want to add any other? I know it got cut off midstream. Anything that we can can add to that? Yeah. So people who might be listening on the webinar, um, we just heard, um, and probably couldn't hear that, we just heard that it went from 10 to 60 some odd percent of, of, of convenience stores and grocery stores, but really the convenience stores having fruits and vegetables. That, that access, and particularly if it's at price points, really makes a difference to communities on tight budgets. And so it's these kinds of strategies and, and healthy signage that goes with it um, that are being introduced and work as well in rural communities as the large urban centers. We have the same problems with lack of access despite um, having grocery stores and big um, retail environments. Low-income communities have the same lack of access that people would experience in rural communities from urban and rural. It's data-driven and it's grounded in community. What we need to know is that um, to make policy change, it has to be owned at the community level. If it's imposed by the state down, by the federal government to the states, down to local governments, it, it, it is not as likely to be adopted. And the challenge for public health folks is really, and, and hopefully some of the skills that you're learning while you're mostly public health students here, is that 
community engagement skills and how to develop data at the local level so people see themselves and are motivated on behalf of their children, on behalf of the elders in their community, on behalf of their spouses and their, and their congregation members, wherever they find their community most tight and most meaningful to them. On behalf of that most meaningful part of our life, we have the data, we see it, and it's grounded in our experience. This is an example, another one from Mississippi, tiny population, 400. They had incredible disease rates in this community. Um, and they, they got together and they had really little physical activity going on. And one of the reasons was that there was no garbage pickup in this community. That is very common outside of um, urban settings is that there aren't city services that, that extend. And so there was really no sanitation available. And the community organized around that. They did community cleanups and they brought in putting some pressure on, on the state to bring in some um, garbage facilities and sanitation facilities. We see this throughout rural America um, where the lack of basic services for health are missing and there is no public policy requiring it. And it's we, it, same issue we were talking about last night was straight piping of sewage. There was nobody's, no tax base to be able to provide services. Um, there, yet uh, what we see in our state of California, a total dependency on migrant labor could not have the agricultural output in our state without migrant labor and yet zero um, sense of um, obligation to be providing services right into the communities that we're dependent on. So this community organized itself. They did not wait for the state to come in. Um, they, they organized, they got it done, and then they put pressure on um, to get the services they need so they could have healthy children. It's ambitious yet feasible. We all work within political environments, and we in public health have ambitions beyond um, often the politics that will support us. And that's just a fact of life if you live in Berkeley, California, like I do, or you live in Macaw County, like the people last night. Um, people want, have great visions. Those of us in public health know how much better community health could be. And yet we work within a, polit within a political environment that is absolutely, um, we have to work through and with, and we'll get part of what we want, not all of what we want. Our suggestion is you start with a robust vision. If you don't start everything, the political po process, you've heard the analogy of sausage making, it's ugly. You're not going to get everything you want. It's always a give and take. In the best of circumstances, it's a give and take. We have to have um, the readiness for an idea to assess the political readiness for it, work with the community partners and experts to make it happen, and recognize that you probably have to give and take. And I want to give an example of some work going on in Colorado, which is just a wonderful um, and I think very hopeful um, example of this. So they did, I'm gonna, this is a breastfeeding example from Colorado. Colorado has some really great and had some really great initiation of breastfeeding, but at the six month mark, they really fell off. So they were the top in the state for initiation of breastfeeding, but then just like everybody else after just a few months. So they put together a 10-point plan. These are the public health advocates. And I don't know if you can see it, but it says, have, have a breastfeeding policy, train staff to implement the policy, start breastfeeding within 30 minutes of birth, inform all pregnant women, show moms how to do it, give only um, breast milk to infants, allow mothers and infants to stay together 24 hours in the hospital, encourage breastfeeding on demand, establish support groups, and no pacifiers. These were their 10-point their, their plan. And this is the baby-friendly hospital movement that was um, had quite a strong support in um, Colorado. But they couldn't get all of that. The, the hospitals weren't going for all of that. Um, and what they, they settled on five core things that they thought, all right, let's, let's go for this. Start breastfeeding within an hour, only breast milk, moms and infants stay together, uh, moms have a number of support, lactation specialists to help them and no pacifiers. They didn't get everything they wanted. It wasn't going to happen. But what their results were is 62% of Colorado moms in the baby-friendly hospitals at six months are still breastfeeding. You didn't have to get the whole picture to have tremendous um, impact and outcomes. So the message here is not to lose hope. We have these huge visions, and yet we're not going to always get it. Start big so you got something to leave on the table and not if 
because you're not going to get everything. This is just kind of being pragmatic. And then know what your bottom lines are for when you, when you move towards, when you have to put, leave some things behind. 62%, highest um, exclusive breastfeeding rates in the nation now. And they didn't get everything they wanted. They'll go back for more. They want to get it to 100%, of course. They're not satisfied at 62%, but it's much higher. And, and they, they were able to drive that success incrementally. It addresses health disparities. And, and we know that um, the, when we make change in public health, it's easy to, so much easier. We've seen obesity rates drop in large part in this country because well-educated white people can read the newspaper and say, oh my God, I shouldn't be doing so much soda, so much juice. Um, easy to happen. It's in low income and communities of color with, with, without strong education, without choices in their, in their convenience store or supermarkets, without price points that they can afford, much more difficult. And that's where the disease rates are greatest. These are the social determinants of health, have a downward slope, and, you, and we have to, if we're going to make change in this country to see the, the health, meet our health goals, we have to be addressing health disparities. We need to be working, and this is I, our, our largest funder is the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, what they would call targeted universalism. Community-wide policy systems, all children deserve access to healthy foods. Community-wide, we're handling this together. We saw so many examples of this throughout. Community-wide, we're putting in the sidewalks and the bike lanes, and community-wide, we're doing the healthy food. But then doing the implementation, the targeted implementation where the need is greatest. And if we don't do that targeted imp implementation, we're going to miss the mark on, on social equity and on meeting our health goals that we were trying to achieve as a nation. And then we've got to imp, uh, prioritize and implement those policies in a very targeted way. All of these things come together because to do that well, it's got to be community-based. You've got to do that community-based education and engagement and partnership. This is an example from um, Northwest Washington, the Lumi Nation. They're in a festival right now, the First Salmon Festival. And they have a population of um, about 4,000 on, on this reservation. And um, about half the population are native born. The other are not part of the tribal community, but they live there, they're married um, in, or they just work and live in the community. So they have an overall, they decided, they have a Lumi Nation Business Council. Um, that business council said for all of the Lumi Nation, we are purchasing food that's healthy. No more sugar-sweetened beverages. I'll read you what they said. The funds and purchase orders may not be used to, to um, purchase sodas for any meetings, functions um, that is sp sponsored by the nation. Um, sodas may not be allowed in, on, in vending machines on school properties and that they, for all events, it will be fresh produce, whole grains, and traditional foods within their nation. It's affecting everyone, but it's going to particularly impact the native-born people because the disease rates, both for diabetes, are twice as high as um, the non-native, and the, the dental, the oral health problems, are two to three times higher than in the white population. So it has, affects everybody, but it's really going to have the biggest impact and in really focusing on the, the activities that are focused for the tribal nation in particular. This is how um, a target, an example of targeted universalism. Financially sustainable. I'm going to give three examples of this. I, I can tell you, maybe aside from San Francisco, there isn't enough money to do anything um, by government, local government. San Francisco's got a lot of money these days because of the high tech industry, but no place else does. And we've got to figure out how do we do this in a way that's financially um, sustainable, feasible and sustainable. And give three examples. We want low or no cost, we want to use existing funding, and we can generate revenues on occasion. This is it. This is my one slide from California. This is a ballet folklorico, um, um, a Latino Hispanic population in our Central Valley, tiny little town of Pixley, um, a few hundred population. I don't, it, I'm sure it doesn't reach a thousand. Um, one little school with no playground. They didn't have a playground. They didn't have a dirt lot. Um, no money for a playground. No sanitation services. Um, 
very little clean water because most of it is contaminated with pesticides. We have pesticide contamination, um, just like you have um, acid contamination of your drinking water systems. Same problems, different state. Um, <clears throat> what they did is um, open up um, the, the community school. This is um, the inside the school in the gymnasium for community use, for recreation. There was no place for the kids to play. They banded together and they got some green space outside of their school. And this was a school that was locked at night with barbed wire around it. Nobody could get in. The one place that was safe, that would, had air conditioning, where kids and adults actually could recreate was closed at 3 o'clock and on weekends. It's called a joint use agreement, a shared use agreement. This, for the perspective of Change Lab Solutions, we do more technical assistance on shared use agreements, opening up existing government facilities, taxpayer dollars for community use in evenings and weekends. It's happening all over the country. Tucson, Arizona has built out without thinking about parklands. They have huge adult recreation leagues, baseball, soccer, all of this, no place to play. The schools are opening up their facilities for adult use after hours. Those adults pay a fee to play on their soccer league. It's paying for the lights. It's paying for the maintenance of the fields. The schools win because they've got added revenue coming in, and they're opening up dozens and dozens of recreational facilities for adults and youth alike. It's happening all over the United States in, in great amounts. Everything that we're talking about here, on I'll give a website at the end, and I've put a business card on the back table back there with, with um, websites. Are, these all take model laws and policies. Models are on our website. Download them, use them. They're generic. They're not, the tobacco control ones are dedicated to California, but everything else you use, you it's may, meant for you to insert your own data, tailor it to how you would like to use it, bikeable, walkable communities, land use strategies, urban agriculture, how to work with grocery stores and food systems to get healthy foods into low income and remote communities, all of this and so many different examples and model contracts between park and rec agencies, school districts, boys and girls clubs um, to, for joint use. You'll see it all there for you to use in your communities. This is an example from Oklahoma. Oklahoma has the fifth highest disease rates in the nation. Um, Oklahoma City, Tulsa are big, big um, cities, but everything else is extremely rural, a lot of um, native populations. They had a low interest loan program for um, agriculture. It was sitting, it was sitting there in, in place for years and years. Nobody paid any attention to it. They had a huge problem with getting access to healthy foods in the convenience stores in rural Oklahoma. What a really um, brilliant state legislature did is dust off what was already on the books. And it was there for, I don't know for what reason, but they said we, they had food deserts all over. Let's use this low interest agricultural loan program and push it out, reinvigorate um, it and push it out um, to small business owners where they, if they don't sell a lot of, of alcohol and tobacco, so they really made it healthy, but um, could expand, bring in refrigeration, um, take some training classes on how to handle produce. You're not born learning that. You got to learn how to do it if, if you've never, if you've never had it before, and um, and put up signage to increase um, um, knowledge about access to fruits and vegetables. Change the the layout of the grocery store so you you really have that image of fruits and vegetables rather than the junk food when you walk in. All sorts of different strategies. The money was there. The politicians won because they didn't have to raise taxes. They they just they had they just reused state money. The local businesses won because they could reinvigorate their corner store, their convenience store, to make it more appealing and and serve community needs. And the community won because they got access. No new money for anything yet. Tremendous impact and tremendous potential in expanding access. And then this is the Navajo Nation. Um, Huge disease rates. I just heard somebody from the Navajo Nation speak. He has um, three aunties who um, have no running water or electricity in their homes. They are, um, have several limbs amputated because of diabetes. 
tremendous health needs, very little resources. The Navajo Nation um, um, just um, this year enacted a junk food tax. It's just going into place. They took taxes off. They had 5% tax on fruits and vegetables, um, and they rescinded that. They had two policy pushes, and they did a 2% tax on junk food and beverages. And those dollars are going to be earmarked for um, agriculture, greenhouses, um, access to food, nutrition education, and all the needs that the Navajo Nation identified for itself. So the Navajo Nation is not known for going out there. This is the first um, um, public jurisdiction in the country that has done anything um, on junk food. Berkeley passed a soda tax, and we're still seeing if that's going to work or not. It's going to definitely generate money. It generated $100,000 in the first month, and that's all going into community gardening programs in our schools and other um, um, urban agriculture. Um, Navajo Nation is um, really at the edge, and um, I read through their public policy and, and the um, public comments on it, and every little Pueblo all throughout the nation had um, um, letters about the disease rates in, in their families, and they're doing this for their kids. Um, so very remote communities. And it has to be legally feasible. I'm going to go through this a little bit more quickly because I'm running out of time. In the law, we call it the rational basis test, and this is somebody smelling a piece of fish. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's what it takes. For all, everything we've talked about today, it is very easy legally to do this. Politically, it can be hard. But everything that I've talked about is legally very easy to do, to put in these policies. You just have to have a rational basis, and, and improving the health of the community is always a rational basis. We call this a police power of state and local government, and it basically it's to improve the health, safety, and welfare. Every state in the nation will talk about, in your case law, police power, health, safety, and welfare. The very purpose of government is health, safety, and welfare. If what you're doing is to improve the health, safety, and welfare, legally, you can do it. We have lots of resources, including when to work with your city attorney, and I don't know if they're called city attorneys in the state, but they are most places, or state, um, state attorneys. In many um, rural states, the, the state provides legal services to local government. We have all sorts of how-to guides, model policies, all with um, the evidence in there to pass the rational basis test. The enforcement needs to be clear. This is the accountability. So here's, this is from Alaska. All right, it says the enrollment in this school is 400 students. This is from seven counties, 400 students, seven counties in Alaska. Gives you a sense of how remote this is. This is to source a minimum of 20% of the school food from local sources in Alaska. They have greenhouses there, obviously. But look at what, this is their policy. Conduct staff training on the preparation, trimming, portioning, and preservation of fresh harvested produce. They have, and they've got who's responsible for it, and when is it going to get done? They, they, are, they have a whole policy, step by step by step. And if they can do 20% of fresh food in Alaska, 20% of fresh food can come in any community, but they've got it assigned, responsible. Here's, um, oh, I'm sorry, this is Richmond, California. Richmond is the community I used to work in right up next to the petrochemical facilities. Um, very low income community. Um, they have embraced health and wellness, high disease rates. Um, they have a whole health policy to their comprehensive plan. And look at this, the health department isn't even involved. Who's the lead responsibility here? Planning and build, building services. This is um, community access and mobility, transit access to, and guides and incentives. That's engineering, public works, planning and building again, redevelopment agency. All of these government services are responsible, and they have timelines and expectations. We've got the fire department here, the Office of Economic Development. This is health and all policies at work, and this is what it takes to make the kinds of changes in, in low-income communities that aren't going to be able to do it just by education alone. And look at that. There we've got it the, in, right in the slide showing that we've, it's, there's accountable. This person's job is responsible to the mayor, to the city manager, to get the job done. It changes the conversation. Oftentimes, New York City, you know, they, they are in the vanguard. They are... They did the portion size. They're right now 
going to require they're going to get sued for this. Um, um, putting little salt shakers on menus that have um, um, when the the, the um, portion that's being given to folks has more sodium in it than than a full day's um, nutritional guidance. Um, they want a little warning symbol. I don't know if they'll get away with it or not, but um, often what, what um, the, Tom Farley, the former health director in New York City, said, you know, we often do it just so we have the headlines. We do more nutrition education for the headlines. People say, what are those people doing now? Isn't it crazy? The big government, rah, 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 rah. But I wonder how much salt is in this and how come they would be serving us one portion that has more salt in it than the, the daily nutrition. And I've got high blood pressure. Or my, it's in my family. I know I'm at risk. It's that um, changing the conversation. When we were going after menu labeling, there was all these little, on the, on the TV, in the newspapers, all these little quizzes you can take. Guess which one is healthier, which has less calories. It did so much um, engagement and conversation. And it's a piece of a larger puzzle. And I kind of gave this punchline away. We're not going to be able to do just one thing. It's taken us a long time to create the obesity epidemic that we have in this nation. It's taken um, several decades, and it's going to take us a long time to work our way out of it. So we're going to be looking at all sorts of different strategies, surround sound for these kids so they can be healthy. It's not just food. It's not just physical activity. It, there is no magic bullet, no simple answer. It's all of these things at once, which is all the more reason why we have to work in collaboration with each other. I'm going to give a couple of quick examples, and I'm just going to move through this quickly. So land use designates a general location of what can happen in a community. Here's a good example of a land use policy. The zoning ordinance for the town of Mayville, West Virginia, adopted in 2005 to amend the land use table to provide for urban agriculture. Blah, blah. Here's better. Same thing only. Provide for urban agriculture, community gardens, urban gardens, be as specific as possible. This is where you're going to know if you've gotten there or not. If you just have urban agriculture, you might want to put in you're allowed to keep bees, you're allowed to keep chickens. Be very specific so that you know if you're going to get there or not. Even better is you have the same thing, but you put some money behind it. You find out how it's going to be financed. These things don't happen by uh, automatically. You've got to figure out the financing for it, um, and it doesn't have to be a big dollar ticket. Here's complete streets. The idea is they're designed to enable safe access if you're a walker, if you're a roller in your wheelchair, if on your bike, if you're a car, if you're mass transit, everybody's got access, safe access to a street. Ensure the street paths provide shading, lighting, seating. These are all important if people are going to act, have active transportation. Better to have a bicycle and pedestrian advisory committee taking a lookout for things, ensuring that the paths are open and usable to all, all types of users. And even better yet, if you've targeted your transportation dollars to active living. State of West Virginia could do a lot better on, I know Christian's in the background, he could probably give us a whole um, lecture on what's happening with um, federal transportation dollars coming to West Virginia. Not so good right now. Um, giving away dollars, um, requiring cash matches from local government. That's not true everywhere. It doesn't have to be that way. And then housing. And I'm not going to go through the housing because we haven't talked too much about housing. But the idea is you can have a good, you can get it better by adding specificity. You get it even better by putting financing on it. And this can be done in public policy. You can have policies on working in shared use agreements we talked about, local grocery stores, stocking healthy foods, building trails and railroad right-of-ways. You've got so much space in this county that is now no longer in the state, no longer being used um, for industry. That has act, you can really think about how you can use that, what is now open space, um, for, to improve community health. And there's um, our webinar. So I'm going to stop and answer questions if I can um, and engage you in what are you thinking? I'm particularly, I'd love to hear from some students. Does this resonate with what you're learning in the School of Public Health? What questions do you have on your role? So we have about 10 minutes for questions because there's a class in here at 10 minutes to 1. Uh, Suna has a microphone. It's important that you ask the question into the microphone because we're recording this. So does anybody have a question or a comment? Up front here. Up front.
Can you use the microphone so we can record it? Unfortunately, in Morgantown, at one time, we used to have two or three small local community stores, which does not exist anymore. The farmer's market are, are not the answers. But you go to a grocery store, and I'm surprised that Morgantown has got a lot of single people, students and retirees. The, the, the supermarkets do not furnish what they need. Everything is packaged. As a single person, I started the package. By the time I get to the end of it, the food is not even palatable. I think what we need is more little community markets that sells food so people can shop there frequently, like every two days or so. I think that's something that something needs to be looked at. I don't know whether it's a community level or what level it is. I, I don't understand that. What a, what a lot of communities are doing is um, instituting food policy councils. And this is big cities, rural communities alike, is what kind of um, food access do you want to have? And if it's not meeting the needs of the communities, and you know, that needs to be communicated up and strategies put together and financed. So in many states have healthy food financing initiatives. These are state loan programs to small businesses to um, increase access to healthy foods. And it could be a grocery store in an underserved area, but by and large, it's the convenience stores. Green grocers is what I hear you asking for, produce markets. There's got to be um, an economic study that's done to show the demand for it, and then a loan program so somebody will come in. It's a business opportunity if you can show, if you can prove the case for it. And chances are you can prove the case for it. This kind of public policy you'd want to do hand in hand with public education on um, the lack of access, the need for access, and, and create a groundswell so you make sure that your um, new business is economically viable. But that is one strategy. Many communities are focusing on grocery stores, but I'll tell you, I don't know anything about Morgantown's economic viability. Grocery stores are not economically viable in a lot of um, small communities. You just there's not enough income. Um, Morgantown probably has plenty of income, but at the small scale store, um, and even convenience stores, CVS's, Walmart, I mean the, 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 the um, pharmacies are moving into healthy food if they can see the consumer demand. A food policy council is often a great strategy for that. Yeah. Uh, one of the challenges that you mentioned, but uh, you might want to comment on, uh, the bottom of the pyramid is the socioeconomic strength and abilities to, uh, to overcome disparities. In West Virginia, there's great economic disparity and the jobs are controlled by industries that are tied to environmental degradation and to personal uh, risk and, and uh, health problems. So it's sort of like if you allow economic development, you're going to get public health problems. Yeah, well, that's definitely been the history of the state. There's absolutely no question about that. Industrial and occupational health as well as environmental health problems. Um, this state is in a quite unique um, position of having to reimagine itself, and that's not easy. I'm not coming in with any huge wisdom on how to do that. It's not going to be fast. It's not going to be easy. But I think it's an opportunity. I mean, the conversations we are having last night, people were talking about bringing in um, tourism as an economic base, and that's going to drive clean water. It's going to drive um, access to safe places to play and recreate. Um, the, the, I think you have an incredible opportunity, because, for better or for worse. You know, that crisis is also an opportunity to rethink how does the state want to be and how are we going to make it economically viable. You've got tremendous cultural and natural resources. Um, and not only for industry, but for recreation and tourism. But it, it's a huge challenge here. I, I don't know that I can say more. You all are living it in a way that I'm not, um, and it's painful. But it has to happen. We've seen it happen successfully in other places. Um, but uh, the whole Appalachian region is um, reworking itself. Yeah. 
So I'm actually a native, fortunate enough to be back here on sabbatical for a while. And one of the things that I've noticed is that, like many rural areas in our nation, West Virginia is being decimated by the prescription drug epidemic and also the use of heroin and other illegal substances, along with the violence that comes with that. I'm wondering if you have any examples or wisdom to share about communities who've taken on those types of problems and issues. Yeah, I do. And that's... Um Thank you for saying that. There's um, a few strategies. One is um, really, and I know we have a pharmacist. I met, or maybe he's taken, he had to leave um, from the school of pharmacy. Um, um, is um, a prescription drug monitoring plan for the state where you can really, and in a state like West Virginia with so many um, um, connected states, you've got a data management, you know, share borders with so many states, a data management challenge, but really working within the state to have all the pharmacies so you can look up, has this person just gotten drugs from somebody else and really track that monitoring? That's one strategy. Um, big data sharing um, complexity for a state like this. Another strategy is getting naloxone use, which is um, preventing drug overdose deaths, not only to first responders, but to family members. So that if, you, if your kid is addic addicted, you can stop the death. I've had several deaths in my family um, just from prescription drug overdose, and the parents found in one instance their son dead, and they could have prevented his death if they had had naloxone. This was Pennsylvania. Um, another strategy and something that I think we have failed at miserably as a country is mental health, community mental health. We have got to have um, come, overcome, this is not only for prescription drug, but for violence prevention. I mean, so many desperate people acting out in violence. We've seen it, you know, just this week too many times, um, let alone um, our, our long history. Um, we have to we have to confront that. We have to finance it. We have to have parity for mental health. Um, we have to talk about it openly. I'm hearing now that prescription drugs are leading to heroin. It's so much cheaper with heroin. Um, there seems to be some willingness, political willingness, to um, middle class kids, not just poor kids, are dying. Some political willingness to overcome this. We've got to maximize that willingness, that, that, that opportunity of an open window to take action. There are strategies, they're not easy. Economic development is one of them, too. I mean, if there's nothing else to do, um, it leads, it's a preconditions for, for addiction. I know we're probably at time. I am here, I can stay until two o'clock, and then I have to get back on the road. Um, so I'm, I'd love to talk in small groups or one-on-one, -on -one, whatever works best, and I know you all have to leave, too, and get to class, so I do. Let's give a big hand to Maris. Thank you so much. And she'll be in the back. I know we have to get out of the room at about 10 minutes to 1, so we'll probably go out in the hallway. And see you guys next month on Friday, October 2nd. Thanks.